among the moderators, uh, instructions were to keep the session going with some humor, which I think with both Mona and Peggy is not going to be a problem, and also to avoid profanity, um, which... No. Oh, which no. do that. I, I don't want to make any promises. I'm not uh -huh. going to make any promises. And you guys are adults. Come on now. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I'm going to give that, <laughs> <No>. <laughs> very brief that. introductions to... I actually can avoid profanity, but I can't avoid explicit well, discussion. Well, I, I, I was actually I was going to say that, in fact, you know, we could have can a we, whole we hour on, like, how words? do you define profanity? Yeah. Let's yeah. talk about that. Yeah. Um, just do the George Carlin thing. Just get him out there. Yeah. <laughs> oh, right, right. Um, I'll let you do that. Um, I'm going to briefly introduce our speakers and then uh, also ask them to do some self-introduction. Um, Peggy Ornstein is a, a best-selling writer of four books, um, five books, thank you. Um, she's a oh, contributing... <laughs> <laughs> really a lot of great books, uh, oh, five, which, will, five, 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 five. which will be available <laughs> at the signing tent, which I'm supposed to mention, um, across the way after this reading ends at 4.30. Um, Peggy's a contributing writer at the New York Times Magazine. She's the author of uh, Cinderella Ate My Daughter, which was a, a great book about uh, princess culture and how it's devouring our daughters. Um, and she's been writing about girls and young women in the United States for 20 plus years. Um, and Mona El Tahawi is uh, an award winning journalist. Um, she's written columns and op eds for the Washington Post. Uh, the New York Times. She's been a commentator on BBC and CNN and Al Jazeera. Um, and uh, they're both talking about new books of theirs. Mona's is uh, Headscarves and Hymens, Why the Middle East Needs a Sexual Revolution. Um, you see that pink features in both of these covers. <laughs> I don't know why that is. Um, and Peggy's new book is Girls and Sex. And unless you've been living in a cave, uh, you will have, will have heard Peggy talking about this very important book about uh, girls' uh, sexuality in the United States. Um, so one way I'd like to ask you guys to um, introduce yourselves is to talk, if you don't mind, about about how... You, I described you both as feminist journalists, and I think you both would be happy to accept, I'm pretty sure, that uh, description. And Mona, you wrote um, in your book about what a big difference feminism made to you personally, and when you discovered feminist writings and how that was a transformation for you. And I wonder if you could maybe talk about that as a way of framing the work you've done as a journalist. Sure, okay. Hello, everyone. Mm -hmm. I cannot guarantee, like, well, I won't say fuck, because it's <laughs> one of my favorite words, so <laughs> be prepared. <laughs> How can you be a feminist and not say fuck? Is that my question? But um, anyway, um, I uh, talk in my book about how I had been a feminist for years before I actually discovered the word feminist. And I think my mother was probably the woman who made me a feminist, even though she wouldn't use that word to describe herself because she and my father met in medical school in Cairo, and they both did their graduate studies together, and they both got a scholarship to study for a PhD in London. So we moved to the UK when I was seven. And then um, during that last year in the UK, my dad couldn't find a job because it was the beginning of Margaret Thatcher recession era. Mm. And so my dad was a perfect house husband with a PhD in medicine who would come and pick my brother up. Now, this is 1981, okay? Mm. Um, who would come and pick us up from school, I went to a good Catholic girls' school in Glasgow, Scotland, and my mom was the breadwinner, and we were perfectly happy with this setup, but Margaret Thatcher's government was not, because according to immigration law in the UK at the time, the father was the breadwinner, and the father was the one who got residency for children, oh, and right. the father had to have a job. So we had to leave, even though we were all perfectly happy. And where did we go? Saudi Arabia. <laughs> <laughs> That haven, yeah, that haven. For and in Saudi Arabia, it was like someone had turned the fucking lights off. <laughs> and, and there I saw my mother with the PhD basically rendered incapable of doing anything except teach in medical school. And, you know, many things happened that I describe in the book. But, but I, once we moved there, I just realized the Islam I knew, the feminism I knew, the strong educated women I knew were just turned upside down. But I discovered the word feminist when I was 19 because I discovered these books on the bookshelves of the university I went to in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. Now, there's no women's and gender studies at King Abdulaziz University in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. So some renegade librarian or some subversive professor put these books and, and feminist journals on the bookshelf of the library and saved my mind, literally saved my mind, because I could open these books and read essays by 
uh, the iconic Egyptian feminist Nawal Saadawi by the mm. feminist uh, from um, feminist sociologist from Morocco, Fatima Mernisi. And these are women from my culture and from my religious background. And I could point to that and say, they too are saying, fuck this shit. This <laughs> is not my religion. This is not my culture. This is Saudi Arabia. And that's how I, I discovered the word for what I was feeling, which is feminism and feminist rage at misogyny and patriarchy. <laughs> And, and Peggy, I mean, you were on a college campus in the 80s. Do you feel like that was when your pe feminism sort of mm, began? No, much earlier than earlier that. Earlier also, yeah, yeah, out yeah. of family no, circumstances I, I, probably also. I remember, I mean, and it's so, I, I, the, the whole time, this whole panel, I kept thinking about, there's so many echoes um, in, in our books, um, Mona's book and my book, and it's, it's almost not, it's not even a matter of degree, it's just a, a matter of inflection. <laughs> um, because when you talk about feminism, you know, saving your mind, I, mean, I, I feel very much that way. Feminism, I think for American women too, makes us feel that we are not crazy, <laughs> you know, <laughs> all the time, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and I think, I'm, I'm a little older than you, and I remember being in sixth grade and going over to my friend Tibitha Shaw's house who had bright red hair and her mother had an apron that said housework is bullshit on it. <laughs> and, <laughs> And, and worked, so nobody was home at Tibetha's, which made it a very nice place to be. And, and I remember picking up an early issue of Ms. Magazine, maybe the first issue of Ms. Magazine, at her, at her house, and they had a, a Wonder Woman comic in it. And we read that avidly, and then we went, because nobody was home, and we put um, towel capes around our necks with clothespins, <laughs> and we climbed up on a ladder to um, the, I, lived in, I grew up in Minneapolis, so we had these detached garages that were on alleyways, and we climbed up on the ladder and got up on the roof of the garage, and, we, and the, the distance from garage to garage was like just longer than an 11-year-old stride, and we jumped back and forth across the garages yelling, Wonder Woman, Wonder Woman, with our towel cape streaming behind us, and I think, honestly, that was the moment that I, that I discovered feminism, and... <laughs> Yeah, and, and I also think it was the moment that that kind of girlhood as as a as a topic um, really solidified in my head because I have gone back to that image so many times, thinking about what you know that moment of that that second of freedom when when I was between roofs and f <laughs> flying in the air and what that was like as a little girl. That's a beautiful image. <laughs> um, well, one of the interesting things you talk about the echoes between the two books is you know the, it. On the surface, uh, the worlds and the political issues that the two of you are addressing in your books would seem to be profoundly different because the Islamic cultures and countries that Mona is writing about have very different laws and regulations and mores uh, governing girls' and women's lives um, than we do in the middle-class American society that Peggy's writing about. But there are several different issues, as Peggy was mentioning, that, that the, the, the way that the two of you write about these issues sort of speak to one another. So I, I'm going to just bring up a couple of different topics and, and sort of see where they take us, if that's OK. I mean, one thing you both write about, which is of profound uh, importance to girls and women, is dress. How, how, do, how do we dress, and how do people perceive us, um, depending on the choices we make in our clothing? Um, and obviously, in what you're writing about, the hijab has a very specific role in that, and that's a, presumably a very basic decision uh, that girls and women either can't, either are allowed to make or have to make. Um, anyway, I, I, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about your own experience with wearing the hijab and how you started and stopped, because that was a very interesting thing to read about, not being from that culture, you know, the, the decision that goes into that, and, and possibly um, elements of that decision that, that you you know, that may be unexpected to listeners here, where it might seem more of a cut and dried issue. Yeah. Right, right. Well, you know, before, I said my family left for the UK when I was quite young. So my parents left in, at the end of 74. My brother and I joined them in 1975. And when I look at family photographs from that time, you know, family weddings <coughs> and stuff, nobody in my family was veiled in any shape or form. And I mention this because I think it's really important to consider dress, you know, regardless of where you come from, whether you're Muslim, Hindu, Buddhist, whatever as um, profoundly political, because of course it is, and especially dress when it comes to women's bodies. So I think I've, I've reached a stage now where when I talk about hijab or niqab, which is the face covering, so hijab, for those who don't know, I mean, I don't know who doesn't know these days because Muslim women's bodies are dissected, you know, front, <laughs> yeah. front right, and center. Yeah. And I discovered from my sister the other day that a white Muslim male reporter for the New York Times, just for your information, 
did this breakdown of Muslim women's clothes, which I actually find stunning. Why the hell did they not find a Muslim woman yes, right. to talk about this? So, you know, we're always, we're constantly dissected by white men, you know? But we're probably going to get into that further later. Um, before I start cussing out white men, I'll talk about my, my hijab experience. We'll, we'll get there. Right? I'm sure we will. I mean, like, between the three of us. <laughs> Hello, white men. Uh, so, thanks, thanks for joining us. So when, when we left Egypt, you know, very few people very few women were veiled in any shape or form. And when we went back for a, a family visit in 1980, because my grandmother died very suddenly, I remember my, my youngest aunt at the time, who was only four years older than me, so I was 13 and she was 17, she'd started to wear this thing, what you would call now a, ch a chador, which, which is very alien to Egypt. Women in the countryside would wear like a simple napkin, uh, like a handkerchief on their head. But this woman, um, my aunt, was only 17. She was wearing what looked like a tent. And Egyptians on the street would actually say this. And I will never forget that we'll be walking down the streets of Cairo, 1980. And people would literally stop her and say, what the fuck are you wearing? What is this tent that you're wearing? This is 1980, huh? Mm -hmm. Now, mm -hmm. I get stopped walking down the street in Cairo because I'm not veiled. And now we're talking about uh, this, during this period, the pendulum, pendulum swung so far to the right that 90% of Egyptian women are veiled in some shape or form. My own personal experience came when I was 16 in Saudi Arabia, and very soon after we moved there, I wanted to hide. And I think the only way that I would describe this is, is for people in this audience, when, when they became teenage girls and you begin to realize male attention is a very, very insidious and, and powerful thing. And for some girls, you just want to hide. And the way that I was able to hide was under something that I was taught my religion wanted of me. So I was losing my mind in Saudi Arabia. I wanted to hide. So I strike this deal with God in which I said, OK, God, they tell me that this is how I can be a good girl. So save my mind, and I'll cover up. Well, <laughs> God, he, she, it did not keep their side of the bargain, because I fell into a deep depression. But I kept the, the hijab on for, for nine years. But but the words that I will end this, this particular segment with is that I say I chose to wear the hijab mm -hmm. and I chose to take it off at the age of 25, but it took me eight years to take it off. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about choice and when we talk about women's bodies and what we can and can't do with our bodies and people constantly say, it's my choice, it's my choice, yeah. Yeah. regardless of what we're choosing to wear. This word choice is very loaded. But I'll also tell you that as a Muslim woman who used to wear hijab, whose mother wears hijab, whose sister wears hijab, and most of my female relatives wear hijab, I realize now that veiling is an, a really dangerous entry point into a very xenophobic, racist, and Islamophobic <laughs> conversation. Hmm. And Muslim women who are in this country where you have this fascist fuck called hmm. Donald Trump yeah. running for president, visibly Muslim women are on the front lines of the most vicious, hateful attacks. Yeah. So when we come to talking about hijab now, I'm, I've come to the stage where I demand that unless, if, if you are a white non-Muslim woman, shut up and listen to Muslim women when we talk about the hijab. Because mm -hmm. this is our conversation, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. this is our safety at stake, mm -hmm. because I know that when my mother and my sister are on the streets of this country where they live, they are at the front line of this fascist struggle and racist, horrendous, shameful time that this country is going through. So mm -hmm. you listen to us, because this is our conversation. Mm -hmm. I think that's a very mm -hmm. important point. Uh, I, there are several things I want to get back to in what you just said, including the different meanings choices have, depending mm -hmm. on whether you're speaking to somebody in your own circle or culture, you know, and I think Peggy will have run into that in, in some of her feminist arguments, but speaking to stick with the question of clothing for a moment yeah. and the issue of choices. I mean, you've written and now talked since you've been talking widely about the book. I know people are very eager to have, to hear your thoughts and what you learned in your interviews with these young women um, about how they feel about empowering themselves by wearing mini skirts to school right. and, and, and how you come to feel about dress codes. And it's and again, it's one of these places where I feel like we're in conversation because it's such a, um, it, it, it really resonates when, for instance, she's not here, right? My daughter um, <laughs> came home the other day really angry because um, a girl at her school had gotten dress coded for wearing um, a, a sweater with a cut out shoulders and her bra strap was showing, but that girl tends to, is a curvier girl and another girl who is not so curvy has the same sweater and has never been called out for that sweater. And so my daughter came home and said, Mom, 
I want to get a crop top and go to school in the crop top and I'm going to show them. And I thought, oh, thank you very much, dress code, for making self-objectification into a feminist act for my daughter. Um, and so I think there's some resonance yeah. there, right? Like, yeah. when is it... When is it a radical act to wear? When is it a radical act to not wear? Mm -hmm. Who is making the choice? And the girls, you know, I, one of the things that I was looking at very much was this idea of hot mm -hmm. um, for young women today. And, and this, you know, it's a very narrow, commercialized idea of attractive. And it's sold, whereas, whereas baby boom parents or Gen X parents would have pushed back against that as, as self-objectification, as self-sexualization. For young women today, they're sold that idea as empowerment and confidence. Mm -hmm. So one of the young women that I spoke with showed me a picture of herself going to a frat party and she was wearing, you know, the crop top and the mini skirt and sky high heels. And she said, I'm proud of my body and I never feel more liberated than when um, I'm, I'm wearing skimpy clothing. And then a few minutes later she said that she wouldn't have worn that same outfit a year earlier because she was 25 pounds heavier. And as she put it, some assholy boy would have called me the fat girl and that would have been bad for my mental health. And so you have to ask, you know, who gets to be proud of which body, mm -hmm. under what circumstances, and who decides? And how liberating is it when ridicule work lurks just around the corner? And when we're talking about these dress code issues, and this really reminded me of your work too, that because I, before I read your book, what I would always say, and, and, and I was so startled or gratified by what I read in your book, that, you know, the, the classic way that we defend dress codes, and I'm not, you know, it's complicated because I don't think the right to bear arms, bear legs, bear midriffs is necessarily a feminist battle cry because self-objectification has a lot of issues and, and um, it, it harms in girls' lives, but at the same time, what is usually said is that it distracts boys. Right. And that is an unsustainable argument mm -hmm. because down that route, road, are two things, you know, I, well, I, I, you asked for it, but what, what I would say is like, when do boys have to take responsibility right. for their actions? Is it when a girl's right. in a miniskirt, when she's in a knee length skirt, when right. she's wearing a burqa? Mm -hmm. And you tell right. a story in your book mm -hmm. about going to Hajj mm -hmm. and being yeah. groped yes. under your fully knee veiled. cut. Yeah, fully uh, veiled. My face wasn't covered, but yeah. fully veiled. And, and you talk about, and I, I will punt this back over to you, <laughs> but the, the, the way that veiling lets men off the hook and allows for sexual harassment and the rates of sexual harassment when women are dressed modestly right. and, and the impact of that. Because we have to police our bodies and also police the way that men, boys and men behave. As right. do we. Right, right, right. right. exactly. And, and it's, yeah. it's a global that's feminine a women, experience. Yeah, that's a women, right. uh, yeah, exactly. A universal female mm -hmm. experience, it seems, is sort of yeah. our, being responsible for Being responsible reaction. for and your... Yeah. yeah. Which, um, and right. it's so, it was so interesting to see so you know, beautifully echoed this idea that it doesn't matter whether you are wearing the crop top or whether you are right. wearing the burqa. Right. Um, so that is not the issue. Right. Well, you know, I, I said that, um, in the book about the, the pilgrimage experience during mm -hmm. Hajj. Yeah. So I was 16 years old and I was groped, to, uh, well, sexually assaulted twice in Mecca, mm -hmm. uh, which a lot of people refused to believe when I first told them. Mm -hmm. But what, once I started telling that story, more and more Muslim women would tell that story. But I bring it up again because I have a good American friend who went to Italy at that age. And at the time, and, you know, she was a um, like white blonde girl, right, mm -hmm. in Italy, not covered in, in a veil, you know, doing, doing pilgrimage. And she was sexually, sexually assaulted several times, the whole, like, you know, bump pinching in Italy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And our experiences were almost mirror experiences of each other because yeah. I wanted to hide behind under my hijab. And she went back to the US and told me she found the baggiest clothes she could wear because she just wanted to hide from men's yeah. hands. Right. So here's this American girl, here is this Egyptian girl right. coming at it from different parts of the spectrum, but all in reaction to how men act like they own our bodies. Right. So it's about, so where do we begin to own our bodies and stop policing them to be safe from men's incapable, uh, men's inabilities rather, to behave themselves and it's always on us, the onus always is on us. And the idea that, um, that's very powerfully put, and I think the idea that these different cultural habits about dress will, pr will um, produce very different results in terms of harassment or groping or rape, it's, there's no basis for that. I mean, right. you, you write very powerfully about the prevalence of you know, sexual pred predators you know, in mm -hmm. the cultures you're writing about. Mm -hmm. um, so it doesn't seem to be advancing you know, no. the, the purity it pretends to mm -hmm. be. Um, we can talk about purity. Um, <laughs> Another and, thing and we both wrote about. Exactly, yes, yes I mean, exactly. That's <laughs> fascinating. So um, 
There, there are a couple of different ways uh, to start this conversation, but, but let's start with virginity. Um, and um, the, you both write about that, and that certainly is something that has very different meanings in the two cultures you're writing about. And maybe we'll start this time with, with Peggy, because um, among the girls you were talking to, it seemed as though, on the whole, virginity was, was, a, was a burden that needed to be kind of shed Really, more than I mean, yeah. you, and we can also talk about your experience at the Purity Ball because that's an interesting one, and and, and there connection. too, yes, exactly, <laughs> that's a connection between the two of you. But but I think maybe first, if you could talk about the um, the double bind that the girls you were talking to were in frequently, um, to, you know, sort of <clears throat> between the possibilities of not being sexually experienced enough, which would make them a prude, mm. and then being which, which well, it's usually almost the, immediately usually into the having opposite too of, much. An, of a negative is a positive, yeah, right. right? But for for girls the, in sex, the opposite of a negative is a negative. They're trying not to be a prude. They're trying not to be a slut. And it was really and, clear for me that um, <coughs> we need to change the way that we define sex for for a lot of reasons for girls. Um, because for one thing, when we define it so narrowly as intercourse we uh, make the other things that they're engaged in um, into not sex, particularly oral sex. And then it becomes not subject to the same rules around responsibility, reciprocity, ethics, respect, coercion, all the things that we expect. Um, it also completely negates um, the experience of gay girls. And one of the um, most interesting conversations I had in, in reporting the book was talking to a gay girl and asking when she thought she lost her virginity. And she said, um, you know, I don't know, I had to Google that. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, this, and Google didn't know, it turned out. Um, and <laughs> she thought about it for a while and she said, you know when I think I lost my virginity was when I had my first orgasm with a partner. And I thought, Wow, you know, what if that was the definition? You know, not because, not because intercourse isn't a big deal. Of course, intercourse is a big deal. It has a lot of implications, but because we have constructed sex for kids at very narrowly and as a race to a goal, and really, you know, when I talk to girls themselves, I say, who is really more sexually experienced? The person who makes out with their partner for three hours, who kisses for three hours and experiments with erotic tension and sensuality and communication and, you know, touch and all of these things, or the person who gets drunk at a party and hooks up with a random to unload their virginity before they get to college, you know? And, and so sort of trying to reconceive, a big part of my book was trying to reconceptualize sex for young people. Um, and, and for a lot of reasons that I write about this is so, as less this race to a goal, less this rounding the basis thing that bakes coercion into the process and sees girls' limits as a challenge to overcome, <laughs> than this pool of experiences that is about warmth and desire and affection and um, sensuality and touch and orgasm and desire and all these different things that can comprise a whole range of behaviors. That's very... Um, I forgot the question. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it's just, it was very <laughs> virginity. <laughs> um, is there room? Multiple virginities. Is, there should be yeah. multiple virginities. Well, so, and uh, that conversation is very different in the cultures you're writing about, but is there, do you find, because in, you write a lot about the, I mean, it's in the title of your book, the, the hymen, the mm. hymen, a girl's hymen might be seen to be more important to, you know, sustain to a family than their or the girl's limb or her eye. There's a no, quote from Noel yeah. yeah, no, no, well, also mm -hmm. um, So obviously the conversation about virginity is very, very narrow mm -hmm. in, in the societies you're writing about. Um, is there also room, do you find that there is also room for other conversations about sexuality? Is that part of what you're trying to do in your work? Or yes. I mean, can you talk a little bit about yeah. that? Well, mm -hmm. I mean, when it comes to virginity, one of the reasons that I wrote this book, um, and this book is, is an expansion on an essay that I wrote in 2012 for Foreign Policy magazine mm -hmm. that was called Why Do They Hate Us, which got me a lot of shit, but I'm happy to get that kind of shit anyway. But um, it, it's interesting. When I saw that that was the title of your essay, because of where we are in this country yeah. right now, I thought it was a reference to why do non Muslims hate well, you know, Muslims, and I realized, no, it's about Muslim men. Well, we took that. See, we took what Fareed Zakaria wrote on the cover of Time magazine after 9-11, where he said, you know, they hate us for our freedoms, and I mm -hmm. said that we don't have any freedoms as women because mm -hmm. men hate us. Mm -hmm. So I mm -hmm. took that and reversed mm -hmm. it. Uh -huh. but, but anyway, the, the, the inspiration for the essay was uh, soon... So when the Egyptian Revolution 
emerged, I'm not going to say began, because I don't believe revolutions begin in a day. Many, many <laughs> things led to the Egyptian revolution, obviously. Mm -hmm. But when Hosni Mubarak was forced to step down on February the 11th, uh, 2011, um, less than a month after that, the day after International Women's Day, horribly and ironically enough, in 2011, the Egyptian military, so we had a, a, a junta that took over. It was 19 generals. I, I used to call them the 19 Mubaraks that took over after the one Mubarak mm. stepped um, down. Yeah. So they were caretaking Egypt for us until we could figure our way. And they cleared Tahrir Square and took the revolutionaries from Tahrir Square, first to the Egyptian Museum, which is horrific enough, and then to a military prison. And in the military prison, they separated the women into two lines. They said, who's married and who's unmarried? And, and the, 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 the assumption here is, if you're unmarried, you are a virgin. And they warned the women who stood, who stood in the unmarried line that if we discover that you are not virgins, you're, you're going to be prosecuted for prostitution. And the way that they discovered that um, whether they were virgins or not was they used the good old two-finger test which is they got a military doctor to basically stick two fingers up their vaginal opening in search for a hymen, which is all levels of ridiculousness because not all women have hymens, some women have stretchy hymens, et cetera, et cetera. But the point here is that the Egyptian military sexually violated, raped, in effect, Egyptian women revolutionaries after we had this glorious revolution. And I was sitting there, and the women who exposed this crime, all about virginity, were called liars. And I was sitting there going, OK, you know what? This is such a violation. We're going to have a revolution now that is going to place women and gender equality at its heart. Because what we had is a political revolution that was women and men rising up against Mubarak. Mm -hmm. And clearly, when the women got violated, the men that rose up against them did nothing. Mm -hmm. So I was like, where mm -hmm. is the real revolution here? So it had so virginity. Mm -hmm. It was all about virginity. Mm -hmm. So I was so enraged. But, but, but the interesting and, and very, very scary thing that happened is that a few months after these awful so-called virginity tests were exposed and one woman who tried to sue the military lost her case, a young Egyptian woman called Alia El Mahdi, by her own volition, in her parents' be um, living room, because she lived at home, stripped. She just had a red bow in her hair and was wearing red shoes, and she took a, a photograph of herself naked in her parents' living room and put a picture on her blog there was more outrage directed at this act of willful nudity as a protest against sexual hypocrisy in Egypt than, than there was outrage directed against the military which raped our women revolutionaries. So I thought, okay, there's something really wrong here. So, uh, so what I'm trying to do in my work, as, as well as, as, as you know, be angry at that, is to take that word virginity and to take that word hymen, which is why it's in my book, and destroy them. Because mm -hmm. what does virginity mean unless it, it involves a penis and a vagina? Mm -hmm. what, does what does a hymen mean mm -hmm. if the military, which doesn't want, and, and the reason that they did this to women, they said, is because we don't want them to accuse us of raping them. So they will rape you so that you don't accuse them of raping you. So I try to talk about sex as often as I can because we're not supposed to talk about sex. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I do in my book is that I, I talk about why so I position headscarves and hymens as the two kind of paradigms because I, I, I believe that Muslim women from the Muslim community and outside the Muslim communities, I should say plural, we are basically defined by what's on our head and what's in between our legs. That's, 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 we're stuck between the two. And I talk in my book about how my struggle against my headscarf and my struggle against my hymen and why my struggle against my hymen took much longer than my struggle against my headscarf. <laughs> And I was just going to say that, I, and I feel very strongly that virginity and hypersexualization of women are flip sides of the same coin. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that was interesting for me in, in my work was going to a purity ball, um, which, if you don't know what that is, it's a, a rite in which um, girls uh, pledge that they will be um, remain virgins, remain uh, um, without intercourse, though they often do other things again, but without intercourse until they uh, enter into a biblical marriage. And I don't know exactly why they say biblical marriage, but they do. <laughs> um, and they pledge to their fathers, and their fathers pledge to protect and cover their daughter um, until that date. Um, and even, and although I felt it would be very easy for somebody like me to go down and, and look at that right and be, um, and just mock it, you know, uh, I also felt like I was looking at it and seeing two other things as well. One was that, you know, the girls that I met too were still defining themselves by what was going on between their legs, and the hypersexualization was not um, was still valuing girls for their bodies, for how they looked over who they were, um, and simultaneously, while it was totally, 
you know, patriarchal, it was totally um, horrifying, um, all of that. It was the only place I went in my reporting where fathers were having conversations with their daughters about their sexual expectations, ideals, values, et cetera. And in the secular world where I came from, and particularly in the liberal world where I came from, if I asked daughters, if I asked girls, you know, how did, you, how did your father talk to you about sex and relationships and intimacy, they would just laugh at me <laughs> and say, you know, my dad thinks I'm a virgin, or my dad would never talk to me about that, or he just makes lame jokes, or, <laughs> you know, something like that. So um, it was, there was a way that it was weirdly moving, even though I hated everything they were saying, <laughs> to see fathers step up at that moment and pledge some support for their daughters. So it was kind of interesting. <coughs> See, I mentioned purity, purity yes. pledges yeah. in my book yeah. because I taught for a while in Oklahoma and I would joke that Oklahoma is like the Middle East. It's exactly yeah. the same. Mm -hmm. Patriarchy, a lot of money and religious <laughs> fundamentalism. <laughs> and when I, when I taught a course there, I showed my class a film called Caramel, a Lebanese film about mm -hmm. the, 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 the women's experience in Lebanon. And one of the characters had hymen reconstruction surgery in, in which an OBGYN doctor would kind of uh, take a, a, a membrane, basically just like a bit of flesh down there and just kind of cover the vaginal opening with it so that the woman you know, symbolically bleeds on her wedding night. And my class was horrified. It was women's and, gen women's and gender studies, which does exist in Oklahoma, and some international um, politics students. And when they were horrified, cause, and they thought, oh my god, it's, what's all this stuff that happens over there? I wanted to mm -hmm. remind them that that, mm -hmm. that stuff that happens mm -hmm. over there is yeah. right over here, yeah. and was so until quite recently. I mean, virginity was a big deal for many Americans until what, the oh, yes. 1960s and the 1970s? It still and, is. Mm -hmm. and, and, and still in that, mm -hmm. in that purity world. And one of my students shocked us all by saying, I have signed a purity pledge with my father. So it became this really interesting moment where we could stop talking about over there and over here yeah. Yeah. and talk about women's experience globally. Yeah. And so one of the things that I do in my book, as well as talking about that, is, is to say, that I was taught abstinence, you know, mm -hmm. I was taught, we all are. I mean, like, virginity goes to the heart of everything. Female genital mutilation is performed right. on girls because it's about controlling women's sexuality, right. because you want to ensure that you hand over a virgin, an intact virgin. And by intact, I mean literally intact, mm -hmm. because in some countries, women, girls, are sewed up, intact. Mm -hmm. And so you want to guarantee that you hand over this pure virgin to a man, and so the sexuality goes from father to husband, whether it's mm -hmm. in a purity mm -hmm. pledge world or mm -hmm. in you know, the, the worlds, the various worlds I come from. And so one of the things that I did, and, and it was one of the hardest things that I did, because I, I hadn't been talking about it publicly, was to talk about how I waited until I was 29 to have sex, like intercourse sex, which saddens me deeply now as an adult, because I love sex. Sex is a beautiful and wonderful thing. And it saddens me deeply that I waited, and I waited that long because I couldn't find anyone to get married to, and I got fed up. <laughs> But, but, but here's the thing, I mean, like, the, the reason, one of the reasons I was able to wait that long, and I, and I say this quite honestly and openly, is because I started to masturbate when I was 11. So again, this is not a conversation that we have. It's not a conversation we have with girls about how you have the right to explore your body and the right to pleasure, your own pleasure, so that when you do get to the stage where you want to get pleasure with someone else, you know what works for you. And so now I'm like, okay, I waited until I was 29. I'm making it, I've more than made up for lost time. <laughs> and, and when I tell people that, you know, the guilt was overwhelming, I tell them I got over the guilt by fucking it out of my system. <laughs> but but, <laughs> but, but I, I say this now, I say this as a Muslim woman. And this is why it's really important when people ask me, why, why are you still Muslim? Why do you still identify? Because it's, it's inherently political for me to sit here in front of you, mm -hmm. but especially in front of fellow Muslims. And I, I've been to India, I've been to Pakistan, I was in Lahore, Pakistan saying exactly this, where I say, we began a political revolution against the Mubarak in a presidential palace, but unless we have a social revolution against the Mubarak on the street corner, who violates my body, and the Mubarak in the bedroom, who insists I'm a virgin until another man gets me, the political revolution will fail. And that word, the, the phrase sexual revolution, means many things. But the most important meaning of it, and this is what I say in Lahore, in Nigeria, in Pakistan, in, e in Egypt and India, is the sexual revolution means or begins with the declaration, I own my body. Mm -hmm. And that means that it is my right to have sex with whomever, obviously with their consent, because consent is a good thing. <laughs> and, and whenever I choose, with a woman, with a man, with whoever. And, for, and this is what you were asking me earlier. As a Muslim woman, I must have this conversation. Mm -hmm. As a Muslim woman, I say it's my right to fuck whomever and whenever. <laughs> and I say this as a Muslim woman. And my last column for the New York Times was about that. And guess what? It was banned in Pakistan. They ran a blank space in the space of the column. But my book is available in Pakistan, but it's banned in Dubai. Glitzy, fancy, cosmopolitan Dubai. So it's a conversation again 
that beyond the one about the veil, which believe me, most Muslim women are incredibly fed up about, we, we have to talk about sex. And mm -hmm. so I go around as the Muslim woman who says, I waited until I was 29, because it is my culture and my faith, but now I'm talking about sex at every opportunity. <laughs> it's, and, and it's incredibly important because it brings out more and more women. And I'm like, I want, and like my ambition right now is to become, you know, the Muslim Dr. Ruth. That's well, what I, I, I want to be the new Dr. Ruth. Nice. Yeah. yeah. We can be the Dr. So Ruth. Peggy S. and Mona will yeah, bring we'll we'll be the answer answer But you know, the, the, the thing, the, one of the phrases that I use in my book over and over is, is intimate justice. Yeah, I was going to ask and, you that, um, and I think that that's a lot of what you're talking about. Um, and Ownership. Yeah, ownership of the body, and also, you know, asking these questions of, and this is something that I really, you know, encourage with with girls in our culture. And I'll, I'll get to that in a second, but the, that, to, just like, you know, for us, who does the dishes is political, right? Who vacuums the rug has a political component. Sex has these pol obviously has these political components, and they involve mental health, personal well-being, power, economic disparity, violence, and we have to ask who gets to enjoy an experience. Who's entitled to engage in an experience? Who's the primary beneficiary? And how do our each partner, how each partner defines good enough, which obviously is very hard for us adult women. But when we're talking about girls and their early sexual experience, you know, I kept coming back to this idea that I didn't want that experience to be something that our girls have to get over. And when you were mentioning, you know, masturbation and um, and uh, girls being physically intact. Um, I talk about the psychological clitoridectomy that we perform on American girls. And what I mean by that is that when we have our babies, um, we have a tendency to name all our boys' body parts. So at least we'll say, here's your pee pee, we'll say something. But with girls, we go right from navel to knees. And we leave like this whole situation here, like unnamed. <laughs> And, the, and which makes it unspeakable, right? And then they go into their puberty education classes and they learn that boys have erections and ejaculations and girls have periods and unwanted pregnancy. <laughs> and you learn that, you know, you see that steer head that's inside a women that looks like a steer head, that thing, and then it grays out between the legs. So we never say vulva, we never say labor, we never ever say clitoris. And not surprisingly, fewer than half of American teenage girls have ever masturbated and then they go into partnered experiences. And we think that somehow our girls are going to have a voice, that somehow they're going to be able to articulate their wants, their needs, their desires, their limits, when we have actually set them up for unequal relationships. And I think that it comes from the same desire to keep our girl, the same mistaken desire. And on, in our case, I think unquestioned um, idea about keeping girls somehow pure mm -hmm. so that they won't engage in sexuality if we just don't tell them it feels good. Well, uh, but then if you're there, mm -hmm. you know, if pleasure has been taken out of the equation for you, why are you there? Mm -hmm. You are there for your partner. Right. And so right. not surprisingly, you know, when I would talk to girls, um, as I said before, oral sex was, was a major, you know, kind of workaround from, for, for not having intercourse when it was female to male. And it was female to male, partly because um, boys, you know, I mean, well, I used to, what I would say to the girls all the time was, imagine you were with a guy and he kept asking you to get him a glass of water from the kitchen and he never got you a glass of water. Or if he did, it was like, <sighs> you want me to get you a glass of water? You know, it was like totally, big. you would never stand for it. And they would laugh and, Say well, when you put it that way, you know, and I would say, well, why wouldn't you put it that way? You know, why would you, why would you be less insulted about performing a non-reciprocal sex act than getting a glass of water? Mm -hmm. And some of it was that boys didn't want to, but some of it was that we had inculcated our girls with shame mm -hmm. around their vaginas and their their vulvas and, and their labia and their experience of their own pleasure and their and capacity their the, to the feel pleasure. The, the I mean, capacity I think to feel pleasure. And the only time they were going down there was to shave their pubic hair off. Yeah. And you know, recently, I don't know if you saw here, but there was a study just recently, or, or a, um, not a, 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 a released um, statistics released on um, labiaplasty. Yes. You know? yes. Yeah. So the American FGM. Yes, yes exactly. 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 Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. labiaplasty among teenage girls has gone up 80% since 2014. If you don't know what that is, that's the trimming of the outer and inner labia to create a fused appearance, which is called the Barbie. Um, 
And yeah, because she's plastic and has no genitalia. And um, we, we and, aspire. We aspire to that. Yeah, they aspire. To, and and so whereas it's still, you know, it's a canary in a coal, coal mine phenomenon. It's a few girls, but whereas teenage girls make up two percent of all cosmetic surgeries, they make up five percent of this one. And I thought, geez, here you are fighting against forcible genital, genital. mutilation in yeah. your country, and our girls are paying for it. Well, well, it's you know, it's. I mean, Mona writes very powerfully about. Um, female genital mutilation, and I, you, I mean, that's a huge topic, and maybe you could say something about that. I was struck in this, you were talking about the WHO having, I'm sorry, the World Health Organization having um, classified what it is, and, and there, there are some strides being made in certain countries, which you sort of document carefully, which countries are making some efforts in that direction, and which are really lagging behind, but, but the fourth point on this, um, the, there were four different items, you know, clitoridectomy um, and other ghastly Things. And the fourth one was um, all other har harmful procedures to the female genitalia for non-medical purposes. And that, that strikes yeah, me yeah. as... It's as because the, the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology had to issue a statement last month saying that there was no medical basis for this procedure mm -hmm. and that it, in fact, undermined sexual gratification and cause, can cause other forms of harm. They had to issue a statement. Yeah, um, and it just yeah, it is an incredible thing. It is an incredible thing. Well, one of the things that's that's particularly heartbreaking in in that section of your book, Mona, is the um, descriptions, which seem to be quite common, uh, tragically, of of mothers sort of considering this uh, yeah. a, 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 a tradition or uh, that they're that they're passing on. Uh, can you can you talk a yeah, little bit absolutely. about that? It's just I mean, so I'm sadly, I have a very very fresh anecdote to share. In that last week, a 17 year old girl in Egypt died uh, during her her own mutilation because she and her sister were sent to be cut. And um, the awful details in the story is that the the doctor performing the cutting was a woman. And it was her mother who sent the two sisters to be cut. Now, I feel really strongly when people begin to say things like, oh, come on, this is nothing to do with patriarchy or misogyny. This is just women doing it to other women. There are no men there. It's not men who do it to them. But I, whenever I hear this, I, I want people to ask why. Mm. Why would a mother who has not forgotten her own pain, who has not forgotten her own mutilation and cutting, and who has not forgotten, because this is something that stays with you for life, obviously, the way that it's affected how you have sex, the way it's affected your ability to have pleasure, and in countries where the most extreme form of, of infibulation is performed, the way you have to be cut open on your wedding night and cut open and sewed up again when you give birth. How does a woman who has not forgotten any of this then push to get her daughter mutilated or cut? And the simple reason and the simple one-worded answer to this is patriarchy. The women do this because they want their daughters to be marriageable. This is all done for men, mm. because if you don't have your daughter cut, she will not find a husband. If you don't have your daughter cut, she's going to be considered wild and, and unchaste and a slut. And if you don't cut your daughter, when she gets married, because the documented stories, her husband on her wedding night can and will send her home and say, if you want your daughter to be cut, you know what you need to do. So having answered all of that, it, women don't do this because they hate their daughters. Women don't do this because they love patriarchy. Women do this because they love their daughters and they understand when you are the weakest link in a patriarchal system, which is the entire world, not just where I come from, when you are the weakest link in this system, you have to survive. And you have to find a way for your daughter to survive. And so one of the things that gives me the most hope these days is a young activist who themselves have survived FGM, who yeah. are willing to talk about this because oh. most women do not talk about this. It's totally taboo. So you would never guess that 89% of women in Egypt, 89% between the age of 15 to 49 have been cut. But in, in the UK and other parts of Europe, and here in the US, and Peggy wrote about a wonderful activist mm -hmm. called Jaha. What's her family name, Peggy? Dukura. Thank you. Yeah. She, was, she was named one of Time Magazine's 100 People of the Year this year. So you've got all these activists now who come from the backgrounds where cussing happens, who themselves have survived, who've, uh, who've sometimes had the reversal of this procedure done, who are now speaking out openly about how it's affected them, and in often, in many cases, providing counseling service. A good friend of mine in the UK is a British Somali woman who is a therapist and who has a counseling service for women who have survived it. And there's a very well-known doctor at Brigham Young Women's um, Hospital in Boston who was a MacArthur Genius Fellow. She's Sudanese Egyptian-American, and she's one of the many doctors now who helped to reverse this procedure. So it, it's not mothers who like to talk to their daughters. It's because unless we unpack this whole system, and one of the last examples I will give is men now 
who are becoming activists in the anti-FGM movement. Mm -hmm. yeah. And there's a great group in Kenya that I follow on Twitter. And what, the founding member of this group sent me an essay he wrote. And he says, you know, so he's got a, a, a petition, and I would love it if you go online on my Twitter account and, and send money to his petition. He asks, why is FGM performed? To keep women virgins, brackets for men. To make women marriageable, brackets for men. To keep women chaste, brackets for men. So don't ask why are mothers doing this. Ask why do men and patriarchy demand this? And when you dismantle that, mothers will stop torturing their daughters in the form of FGM. And I, I just like to say that you know I think it's so it's so yeah it's so um, courageous whenever a woman stands or a man stands up in a culture. I know that Jaha, um, who I, whom I wrote about. Uh, has you know gets death threats. Mm -hmm. uh, it's 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 very very hard, and that as um, people of conscience outside of your community, we need to stand with you mm -hmm. when that happens, mm -hmm. and and not say oh this is a cultural thing. There are there yeah. are absolute evils. There are yeah, absolute right. unacceptable yes. things, yeah, and right. this is one of them. And I just. Yeah we need to offer our support to you. Well, I think the best way that you can is to make that connection you made between yes. labiaplasty and yes, that. Yes, because yes, I yes. think when yeah. people from, from right. the community see someone from outside come in, it's like the yeah. defenses go yes. right up and like, leave me alone, this is my culture, this sure. is my religion. Yeah. But when we make these connections and you say, okay, I'm fighting this form of FGM in the United States, I see you over there, mm -hmm. and we can share yeah. best practices, right. and let's, as women and our universal experience as women fight that, I think that, that makes the defenses come down, yeah. and we can definitely see how we can learn from each other. And, and I think building those bridges between cultures in some of the various areas we've been talking about, where we don't have that us, you know, us versus them. I mean, we are dealing, we are all dealing with, you know, trying to empower girls and women and trying to, you know, define them, have them, give them the ability to define themselves. Yeah. Um, and, and so making links between also aspects of American culture, since particularly in our delightful bubble of Berkeley, we can think that everybody thinks the same in the United States, mm -hmm. which is manifestly really untrue. Mm -hmm. um, one of the interesting things you um, write about in your book is the, is the his, you know, sort of a Victorians who were uh, pro proponents yeah. of clitoridectomy yeah. and that there was some you know, that, that um, it was seen as a way of calming. calming Not women getting down. rid of hysteria. Well, yes, exactly. Yeah. Hysteria yeah. and nymphomania yeah. and lesbianism. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it would do that, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 but, but you know what you say about Berkeley? I think it's really important also. I mean, like, you know, in my book, I rail and rail and rant against sexual violence and the sexual violence that happens to women, whether from the military or the Mubarak on the street, etc. But look, here at Berkeley, you, you've had these awful yeah, scandals about sure. sexual harassment sure, from sure. professors absolutely. to students, yeah. right? Yeah, absolutely. That awful story that came out recently in BuzzFeed that my boyfriend brought my attention to. Hello, babe. <laughs> um, <laughs> my beloved is there, and I always embarrass him at, at events. But anyway, um, so this awful story about the, the young woman who was raped by a Stanford student oh, who was a swimming oh, who champion, got six, right? Got he months. got six months. Six and in, yeah. months. In, in because, the story because... where they reported this rape, right? And she, was probably had, she probably had her drink spiked. Mm -hmm. uh, after, like, you know, his name, they actually put his swimming times just so that you know what a fantastic swimmer yeah. he is. Well, that's this why is he happening could, in California. That's why he could only get six There's months no because exactly. he had this promising swimming career. You know, it doesn't ruin his it. life. So, you know, when I talk right. about sexual violence, it, it, again, it's not over there. 25% oh, sure. oh, sure. of American mm -hmm. women experience sexual violence violence on university that's right. campuses. Right. That's yeah. shameful. That's, you know, what I, I kept struggling when I was trying to tell yeah. people about how, the parallels that I saw in in our books, and people would say, but, you know, but it's worse, and I go... It's so bad over there, right? Yeah, not so much when you've got 25% of girls being right. sexually assaulted on campuses. You know, I mean, the, it's, it's the flavor is slightly different, mm -hmm. but the issues are, are not, and, um, you know... Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it's about you know it's about laws it's about a system mm -hmm. right. it's about accountability it's about impunity and so when you hear about a, a philosophy professor you know I can't remember what college he's at sexually harassing one of his students when you hear about these things happening in Berkeley you know this bastion yeah, sure. of liberalism sure, sure. and freedom you have to you have to see that spectrum of misogyny right. Right. that connects us all as women globally and you have to put patriarchy which became this word got out of fashion didn't it no yeah. no one goes around saying patriarchy no, this is patriarchy <laughs> and it's all about men, yeah. and it's about how men and their lives dictate our lives here in California and in Cairo. Well, and that's the connection. You know, both of us also talk about um, about the importance of sex education at the end. Oh God! Yes. And and you know, I don't know if y'all know, but 
there's only 23 states in our country that mandate sexual sex education and only 13 mandate that it be medically accurate. Um, because it's, it's really helpful when it isn't yeah. medically accurate. <laughs> it means that you can't that's, say that's, things that's like that 80% uh, that, that uh, the birth control pill is only 20% effective or that all gay boys have AIDS and that it's transmittable through tears. It means that you can't oh. say things like that if it's medically oh. accurate. But it wasn't, our state is one of them, and we now have the yes means yes legislation that um, will require consent to be taught in high school. I don't know how that will roll out, but we'll see. But, but it wasn't until last year that the city of Clovis was found in violation of um, that medical accuracy clause because it was in its unified school district teaching high school students that an unmarried woman who has sex is like a dirty shoe and having them chant anti-gay slogans. So, you know, yes, in mm -hmm. California. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but what I wanted to do in, you know, was, was to, in, you know, to add a ray of hope here, to, um, to show kids who, boys and girls together, working out these issues and, and finding solutions and, and being open-hearted and open-minded. And so I ended in a, in a co-educational classroom, sex ed classroom, and there's one point where a boy raises his hand and says, um, and I love because you two come to good men at the end, mm -hmm. um, such as your beloved, and, uh, <laughs> and, and mine who's not here. Um, and <laughs> He's up gardening, I don't know. Um, but uh, he raises his hand and he said, you know that baseball metaphor for sex? In baseball, there's winners and there's losers. So who's the loser supposed to be in sex? Mm. And I would actually submit to you that girls aren't even the opposing team. They're the field that the game is played <laughs> on. And, and I thought it was, it was such a great moment you know, of breaking down that idea, breaking down that patriarchy, because that boy is going to go into his relationships, whether they last for 10 minutes or 10 years, more as a partner mm. you know, and less as an adversary to, mm. to his girls. And that idea, again, I mean, I, what I... What I also come down on is the, do you all know the pizza metaphor for sex? Have you heard the pizza? So this is a very, you can only, yeah, it's Al Vernacchio's pizza metaphor. He's the, the guy who came up with this. And if you take nothing else home to your children, you can take this. Instead of rounding the bases, talking about sex as a pizza. Because a pizza is a dining, you know, we decide if we're hungry for pizza. We go out to pizza and then... We go together and we want everybody to have a good time, so we negotiate our toppings. <laughs> and <laughs> maybe I like mushrooms and you like pepperoni. And so we go halvesies. I'm going to make you eat pepperoni. pepperoni. <laughs> yeah, this <laughs> pepperoni this time. Mushrooms. And if you keep insisting on pepperoni and I keep kosher, honey, I'm not going to keep going out to pizza with you. You know, you would never shove pizza down somebody's throat. It's like, you know, it's, it's about a shared experience that everybody enjoys together. You can start, and, and, and even with girls who have a tendency in their personal relationships to, to express lack of caring, you know, who will say whatever you want, who, who don't know how to want. You know, you, have, you can say, you can stretch it to girls you gotta want, because if you don't care about your pizza toppings, you're gonna end up with green peppers, and nobody likes green peppers on their pizza. <laughs> and, <laughs> I have to. <laughs> you know, so, it's, it's, it's a, so it, you know, this idea of trying to transform the way that we think about this. So, because I, I think it's fundamentally not patriarchal to think about sex like a pizza. Um, I, I want to. I would like to build on the pizza metaphor, but I also would like to open up to questions because we have about ten or fifteen minutes left, and I'm sure that, that there's so many things we've been talking about. Would, sorry to. <laughs> but it's just like I'm finding like there's also a horrible violence and the, everyone's like oh this horrible violence is fine and this sexual assault thing is fine but oh no this sex is no 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 you can't do that so what, what do I do <laughs> like with, with that and I was just wondering if your advice is to kind of what your advice would be to, to open up that conversation because I think sometimes it's hard maybe for people who are even pro-sex like to think are kids ready for this? And yeah. what do you put in a book? And I not real I didn't realize how important it was when she started. To me, I think it's really important to have it in the book. You know, one of the things that, that I, I did when I was writing was to, in, in this pizza 
Yes, the question was that the, um, she's writing a YA novel that contains instances of sexual violence, which nobody protests, and instances of, what was the other thing that nobody protests? Um, it's really violence. Yeah, violence. Um, regular, non-sexual, not regular, but other non-sexual violence. <laughs> regular old violence. Um, but, but that when she talks about a girl discussing what she likes and doesn't like in sex and not wanting to have intercourse because it gives her UTIs, people say that's over the line. And so how do you address that? You know, one of the things that I talk, I mean, I think this is a cultural issue in our country that um, I talk about how the Dutch, uh, the differences between Dutch and Americans in their um, perspective on kids and sex. And there was research that looked at Dutch girls, Dutch college students and American college students talking about their early experiences. And in every instance, whether it's fewer negative things like pregnancy, disease, regret, drunkenness, and ev or more positive things like knowing your partner, enjoying the experience, being able to communicate. Dutch girls do better, and they say it's that parents, teachers, and doctors talk to, their, to those kids from an early age, very frankly, and parents in particular, while they're not less comfortable, or more comfortable than American parents, American parents, and this, is our, this is, gets back to your question, our orientation is we talk exclusively about risk and danger when we talk about sex, and Dutch parents talk about balancing responsibility and joy. And that's what you're talking about. And I do think there are examples of that in YA literature. For instance, I mean, this is going way back, but forever, right? You, if you read forever, so I, if I were you, I would, for people who are saying that's over the line, or if you're trying to pitch your book, I mean, I can't, I don't know publish, I don't know YA publishing at all, but I would say, like forever, my book, um, allows a girl to have sexual agency and sexual discovery in a positive, responsible way. That's what I would pitch. So, oh, sorry. Okay, there we go. That's a good one. So uh, I moved here from Texas around eight months ago, and when I was there, I was the big sister to a girl who came here from Mexico when she was seven, very Catholic family, single mom, and I couldn't help thinking as you talked about sex education and as you talked about these things, I wonder if these fathers don't talk to their children about sex because they're worried about being seen as predators or they're, they're worried about our culture vilifying them for talking about sex as a source of pleasure with their daughters or talking about sex in any way with their daughters unless it's not having sex as a way to talk about sex. You mean, you mean fathers sort of exactly. across the board finding how, how an interesting point. is it a question? I mean, exactly, and so, and, the re and so what it brought me back to is how I talked to my little sister about sex, because when I, when I moved away, she was already 16. And you know, I taught her how to put a condom on a carrot, but like to, to talk to her about seeking her own pleasure or, or masturbation or looking at sex as a source of joy, probably would have gotten me kicked out of the program. Mm -hmm. So yeah, how, how do we, as a culture, come, come to see that in a more acceptable way? Well, I mean, that's the dilemma, isn't it? And I think it is hard when it's not your child and you don't have that permission, but I think we start with, in our own lives, I think we start with ourselves, um, you know, as adult women, understanding our own bodies, understanding our own sexuality. I think that that can be a painful reckoning for a lot of us. Um, and then I think we start with the children that we can talk to, um, the, the girls that we can talk to, whether it's our, I mean, I am a mother of, a, of an almost 13 year old, so that was my, you know, that was a big motivation for me in writing this book was that I was, you know, I live in Berkeley and I was hearing a lot of stories about hookup culture, I was hearing a lot of stories about binge drinking, I was hearing a lot of stories about sexting, I was hearing a lot of stories about assault from friends with older kids. And I, you know, my initial response was like, I don't want to know because parenting from ignorance and fear is a fairly good strategy, I think. <laughs> and, it's, work, and, uh, work, it's worked for generations. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Um, but you know, I had to know. And, and, and by you know, one of the reasons I, I wrote a book was that I wanted it to be a window and a mirror for parents and for girls so that they, and boys, so that they could look at it and, and talk about this in a way that isn't you know, necessarily talking about themselves, which can feel mortifying. Um, but talk about it, that to, to listen to, like the, you know, I think frankly, the thing that has done more good or, or had more impact than the book itself is the Fresh Air interview I did. Mm -hmm. um, and I cannot tell you how many people write to me, come up to me and say, I listened to that interview in the car, because it's always in the car, right, that you want to <laughs> talk to your kid. In the car with my daughter, in the car with my son, mm -hmm. and we had the most amazing conversation, a conversation like we never had. Some of you probably had that happen to you. Mm -hmm. um, and you can do it, 
but I think it has to start in our lives and radiate outward. Um, and I think that also those of us who believe in comprehensive sex positive education, there are some great curriculums. The Universalist Unitarian Church has a fabulous curriculum. Um, one, uh, the, um, oh, there's a, UNESCO has a fabulous curriculum too. We need to be noisier because the people who believe in this abstinence only crap, which does not work, are really loud, <laughs> right? And they go out there, I mean, they threaten to shoot people. And we have to stand up and go, nuh uh. <laughs> we want our kids educated because we don't want them getting, you know, ha having higher rates of pregnancy disease. We don't want them having, you know, anal sex to get around having intercourse. We don't want these things. We want our kids to have ethical, responsible, reciprocal, enjoyable, intimate lives on their own terms. And we've got to stand up and say it. <laughs> You know, you mentioned Texas, so I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but Texas is also the state where, you know, 40 abortion clinics have shrunk down to 10, right? And so, they have the, one of so the highest rates of teen pregnancy. So we're not talking just about how do we educate our children, and we also have to in include in this conversation, and I, I speak now as an American, because I was speaking earlier about specifically my, you know, my initial part of the world, but I'm Egyptian American, and as an American, I, I have to include race and class into this discussion sure, of sure. sex, because when you talk about race and class, so, you know, the white middle class experience of sex is very different than, than, than you know, someone from a, a less privileged background. And I think Texas and Indiana and other states, now when you look at a case like um, the um, Pervy Patel, who was sent to jail for um, more than 30 years because of a miscarriage, and it was called feticide. So you're seeing you know, more and more states that are considering women basically walking incubators. Yeah. Uh, women of color, women from um, less advantaged backgrounds, having less and less access to contraception. So it's not just about sex yeah. education, it's about, okay, when you do have sex, where, where am I gonna get contraception? Yeah. If I do want to have an abortion, because I believe in a woman's right to a free and uh, safe and le legal abortion, I wish we could have it free for everyone who wanted it, but you know, safe and legal abortion, where am I going to go? I'm, I'm, do I have the car to go to, the, to get that abortion? Do I have the money to get that abortion? So in a state like, like Texas, it, it's the perfect combination of talking about race, class, and gender, and access to not just the information, but to reproductive rights and reproductive justice. And I think this is a conversation that is often missed in this country. And, and that's why I keep bringing up Pervi Patel. Pervi Patel is a woman of Indian descent from a Hindu family who's in jail right now because she's a poor brown woman. When privileged white women start going to jail for feticide, then it becomes an issue. Mm -hmm. So, and, 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 and you're talking about the canary in the coal mine, right? Poor brown and black women mm -hmm. are being mm -hmm. sacrificed left, right, and center. The majority of white women in Texas voted against Wendy Davis. Who voted for Wendy Davis? And Wendy Davis still lost women of color. And it, the majority of, of, of women who vote for, for the Democratic Party are women of color. Mm -hmm. So who is upholding reproductive rights and reproductive rights in this country? It's uh, reproductive justice, I mean, it's women of color. So I think, you know, and I speak to you now as a white woman and I'm a woman of color, it, you are obliged to recognize your privilege and to recognize that when you talk to people who have less privilege than that, that it also has political implications when it comes to women's ability to survive sex, let alone get to the stage of having sex. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, conversely, when I was thinking about that Stanford boy that got um, sentenced to a mere six months. I thought, what if that boy had been poor and oh, brown? Sure. Oh, Do you think he would have Don't been sentenced even ask to that six question. months? Yeah. He would have disappeared. Yeah, yeah that's, I, I have a ton to say and my head is going a million just things. So I'm just gonna stick to the question um, and take you guys both back to where you opened up with this question of being a feminist. And um, Peggy, your book does a really good job of respecting the girls, uh, which isn't always something that we see when we're talking about girls and sex. Uh, there's another book out right now that I don't think does as well Thank with you. that. <laughs> um, that being said, I remember when my uh, stepdaughter was 14, which is uh, about five or six years ago, uh, having a conversation with her, and I came away from it thinking to myself, feminism has failed. Mm -hmm. And I would like you to go back to the conversation about how you think about um, dealing with what our co-option of feminism, and particularly around corporate feminism, yeah, yeah. And, and the things that you brought up in your What's previous book? book. What's the new book about that, Andy's do you know? Eyes. Yeah, Andy's yeah. Eyes. So new book. We Were yeah. Feminist Once? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah okay. I haven't gotten through that yet. <laughs> but um, the idea of how we navigate the complexities of feminism and sex positivism when it's been co-opted a little by um, corporations and girl power movements and those types of things, which I think ties your two books together quite well. Yeah. So 
if you could oh. talk a little <laughs> bit about that. I know. I think we need to ban the word empowerment. I think that would do a really good start. <laughs> I hate right. that word. I know, it's awful. It's awful, awful. and it's usually so nonspecific. It as, doesn't mean as, anything. Really. No, it doesn't. You know where I, I really felt when I was talking to the girls, though, I thought I did feel like what happened to our bodies ourselves, right? What happened to... Right, you, all of you who are, who are over 50 know what I'm talking about. Um, <laughs> seriously, I think if you're under 50, you don't even know what it is. And, and I think, I, I mean, I keep wrestling with what, what happened, what happened. I'm not 100% sure, but I think, you know, it had something to do, the strands have to do with the backlash against feminism in the Reagan years and beyond, um, the AIDS epidemic, which for a whole generation of people, suddenly intercourse equals death. And I think that that was traumatic in the extreme for people who are a little bit younger than, I mean, for all of us, but I mean, for for um, folks that are a little younger than, than me would have been more um, affected as teenagers with that message. And that allowed the abstinence only people in um, because then they, you know, then you shouldn't be having intercourse, so then you got these abstinence only people. And simultaneously, it made a more explicit conversation about sexuality that allowed the commercial interest to come in and um, be more overtly sexual and something in that stew created a situation where when I was a teenager, you know, there had just been this, vi I, I didn't know this until I started doing this research, but there was a viral, um, or uh, what at the time, vi you know, mimeographed, you know? <laughs> You're not that old. Yeah, no, it was, it was mimi. I am that old. It was, it's, I mean, when I was little, it was, it was there was a mimeographed, um, treatise on the clitoral <laughs> orgasm. There was a guy on the street and he was just Yeah, the guy on the street <laughs> with, with a <laughs> megaphone. No, but... Uh, <laughs> and a ram's horn. Um, no, they, they, it was a mimeographed thing that went viral about the, the myth of the vaginal orgasm. Oh, and yeah. it, oh, it, yeah, was a yeah, yeah. it was very political and it made orgasm into a political thing. And I, feel, I didn't know that, but being a, a little younger than that, that was the ethos that had seeped in that I didn't know that that was what we were talking about. And I've done several readings now where friends of mine have been, college friends have come up to me and said, what happened to take responsibility for our orgasms? And they all do this, right? <laughs> and I'm like, hell if I know, man. I mean, we were all about take responsibility. I mean, that was, we were owning our bodies and I just assumed that would continue. And somehow we, I gotta say that as women, somehow I think we dropped the ball and I'm not sure why or how, but I think it happened. I I I'd also like to answer this. I think you know when when I came across essays that have been written about this book, and when I came across, and you know, I follow bitch media. So and and bitch media up until this point, I thought, wow, bitch media is doing a great job. And then I saw you know the essays written, out, and I, I got to say, I haven't read the book yet. But you know, my first the first thing that occurred to me was you know, feminism is not an American property. What she's talking sure. about is a specifically white American phenomenon. Mm -hmm. White American. So we're talking about white feminism, right? Mm -hmm. Because you know, last year I went to Nigeria and India, and this year I went to Pakistan and I just came back from South Africa and they were not sitting there talking about this okay and they uniformly hate Emma Watson's feminism I've got to tell you this he for she rubbish <laughs> is not going down and so when I saw this I was like whose feminism are you talking about because in Egypt right in Pakistan I mean in Pakistan I went out with these young feminists who are claiming, reclaiming public space by going to all these um, roadside coffee shops it, that, that are male-only, you know, male-dominated spaces in the same way, and I don't say this to make light of the civil rights movement, but in the same way that young black women and men were going into whites-only counters and, and demanding lunch, mm -hmm. you've got these young feminists in Pakistan going to roadhouse cafes and demanding to be served. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm not sitting there looking mm -hmm. at this. And you know, when I was in Nigeria, there was this great discussion between two openly gay Nigerian men, one of them who came out he came out on live television in Nigeria, you know? Yeah. And, and then we had a, this feminist circle talking about LGBTQ issues and to be queer in various African countries. And no one is sitting there talking about these issues. So this is a, this, it's a privilege to talk about feminism like this. I'm like, that's not my feminism. I'm going around making sure that, you know, girls can actually say I want sex and I enjoy fucking. And you're sitting there saying we were once feminists. I'm a feminist now. Yeah, yeah. And feminism is un a universal need now. And there are young women across the world and men who are making feminism a vital thing. So this is an American, it's on you, America. Well, I think, yes, I think you're right. But I think, I think that what Andy is, is saying in that book is, is, is exactly what you're saying, that that is feminism and that in our country there has been a, a co-optation of feminism by commercial interests that sell empowerment to us as you know, a lipstick or mm -hmm. that, but, but that, I, I, that there is still 
a beating heart of real authentic but, feminism. But, underneath but there's that. also, I mean, it's when you talk about the word patriarchy. I mean, you know, it may not be as current as it was when we were on the college campuses, but but Lord knows, you know, that issue is and absolutely shaping our electoral election campaign right now. You have a groundswell of young. I mean, it's a si it's, yeah. it's like a side by side thing where on one hand there's a kind of um, pop culture feminism that is about um, commodification and selling, and yeah. then there's yeah. um, this really authentic movement to make college campuses safe for women to learn, mm -hmm. and a really authentic movement where girls are doing work um, and joining with people around the world in our country, mm -hmm. and doing real media critiques and talking about the harm of the media to American girls. And so I think those things are, are existing side by side, and it has been really heartening, I think, in the last five, 10 years, or maybe not even 10, like since I'd say about 2011. Um, well, I, mean, well, I, I see that. Well, I think in the United States right now, well, you've, we've, we've got this electoral campaign, right, where you've got this fascist, misogynist, homophobic, bigoted fuck called Donald Trump, and then you've got Hillary but Clinton on the other hand. I know, right? <laughs> now, I'm not a huge fan of the Clintons, right? I obviously yeah. like a woman to be a president, but, you know, Hillary Clinton does not have a great track record for me, and then you've got Bernie Sanders and his Bernie bros, and these, you know, privileged left white men. My God, white leftist men are some of the worst misogynists <laughs> on earth. <laughs> Yeah, okay. I'm sitting there going, who the fuck am I going to vote for? So I'm really hoping, I'm really hoping that this election campaign, you know, really puts fire in the belly of feminism because, you know, what, what feminism begins and ends with is, do you think Beyonce is a feminist? I'm right. like, for fuck's sake. Exactly. But come on. Well, but, but you know Andy's what? Critiquing. But, but no, but about Beyonce though, Beyonce puts forward very, very, you know, necessary discussions about violence against black men and women, about Black Lives Matter, which was started by three queer black women. Let's remember that. Mm -hmm. Three queer black women and Black Lives Matter is the revolution in this country. So mm. these are the conversations we need. Feminism and, and the way it intersects. We've got Donald Trump, for God's sake, Bernie Bro uh, Sanders on the other hand, and Hillary Clinton and her legacy. And I'm like, God, we're screwed in this country. <laughs> yeah. Come on! Um, I, think, I think we need to so, so wrap one, it up. There's one more, I'm sorry, one more yeah. question. Or, sorry. Quick and loud. Quick and loud, good. Mm -hmm. around feeling good about her body and one of the things that I am really curious about with both of you is just thinking about when and how to talk to her about sexual violence because I would mm -hmm. like for her to hear it from me first mm -hmm. but I don't want to like get yeah, too fair. far out ahead of that train mm -hmm. but, um, and thinking about sexual violence both in terms of intimate violence and SDM for her as a black girl mm -hmm. like Yeah. But I, you know, it's like, it breaks my heart when I think she doesn't know. Yeah. You know, and one day she's going to know. I know. Isn't that awful? It's it, to know that your child is going to. But, you know, I've, I've found that it, especially living in Berkeley, that that conversation came up fairly naturally. If that, I mean, not that it's a natural, that that should be a natural conversation to have to have. Came up, you know, when we read To Kill a Mockingbird. It came up when. Um, you know, it's and, and by seventh grade, it's clear, and you can have those conversations. I, I, I think now my daughter can really have those conversations in a thoughtful way, and those conversations need to be balanced with the, the joys, and with you know with with that that your body is. Um, and, and I think you know from a young age, learning about bodily integrity is really important. Your daughter's a little older, but you know when when kids are little. If they don't want to hug Aunt Nancy, right. you know, don't make them hug Aunt Nancy. <laughs> it's their damn body, you know. Or, or on a on a more positive side, you know, anybody who has a preschooler knows that they masturbate constantly, <laughs> and you know, you say that it really feels good to touch your vulva, honey. We don't do it at the Thanksgiving table at Grandma's house. <laughs> you know, we do it in our rooms. That's, that's your family. Um, I am afraid. I, I'm afraid uh, we have to. We have to wrap up. You know, there. So whoever sorry. just said that, you need to go to the Facebook page. Your mom is so Berkeley immediately. Um, <laughs> okay, I'd really like to thank Mona Altahawi and Peggy Ornstein. I'm Sabi Bernard. <laughs>